Did you see him at all? Yes, he's a young 21-year-old white dude. Okay. We got some people very hurt, please. Yes, ma'am. And you said that, were you able to see the gun? Do you know what kind of gun it was? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about guns. Okay, that's okay. This scene looked like something from a war movie. Blood was all over the place, leaving the air with an almost metallic taste. There was so much. The floor was stained red as it flowed all around deceased bodies, mixing with bodily fluids that excreted as victims passed from this world. Shell casings laid everywhere, and the stench of gun smoke and fear lingered in the air. John fled the church, muttering behind him about plans to kill himself, which was later testified to by Felicia Sanders. Outside video surveillance cameras showed John leaving the church at about 9.06 p.m., exiting through the same door he entered. As he walked away, he could be seen dropping his tactical pouch. He got into his car and drove away. It was later reported by John during his interrogation that he hadn't planned on surviving the shooting, and therefore had no further plans, meaning John didn't exactly know what to do next. Absent a plan, he drove around aimlessly. Meanwhile, police had arrived and photos of John and his vehicle were being splashed across the evening news all over the country. A manhunt was soon underway and lasted throughout the night. A woman named Debbie was driving when she noticed a vehicle with a three-flag Confederate States of America bumper sticker. This gave Debbie a chill to her core. You see, she recognized this car from the news and believed it to be the Charleston church shooter. Debbie also noted the unmistakable haircut and knew in that moment that she was uncomfortably close to a mass murderer, one she believed was unpredictable and could start shooting at random at any moment. And this made her incredibly nervous as she called in the sighting. John's half-sister recognized him from the news, too, and called the police to report what she knew. At 10.44 a.m. on Thursday, June 18th, John was arrested during a traffic stop in Shelby, North Carolina, approximately 245 miles from the church. The police officer ordered John from the vehicle, and as he was getting out, police noted a GPS unit sitting in his lap. One of the officers asked John if he was involved in the Charleston church shooting, and John simply replied, Yes. John informed police that there was a firearm in the back seat. After police retrieved the forty-five caliber pistol, a thorough search of the vehicle was conducted. John was handcuffed and taken to the Shelby police station to be held until the FBI could arrive and begin their interrogation. This is an ABC News special report. Deadly church shooting. Tragedy in Charleston. And good morning, I'm Amy Robach. We are interrupting your regular programming for breaking news in that deadly church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. We have just learned the suspect, 21-year-old has been caught in North Carolina. Attorney General Loretta Lynch confirms he is now in police custody. A full investigation had already started even before John was arrested, and anything he might tell police could help fill in any missing gaps of information. John waived his Miranda rights and immediately confessed to the shooting, which will be discussed at greater length shortly. On the investigative end, police used the GPS unit found in John's car to review the routes he drove before and after the shooting. The FBI was able to determine that John left Columbia at 6.13 p.m. and drove approximately an hour and a half to Charleston. Based on the GPS data, the FBI knew that he had made several trips to Charleston before the shooting stopping at various plantations and snapping selfies on the beach. Videos were found, and they depicted John doing target practice in his backyard, shooting at various objects in the yard. A search of the house in the yard later produced numerous shell casings, corroborating the videos. On June 20th, 2015, the FBI discovered a website in John's name. The website held John's 2,444-word manifesto which detailed each of the dark, disturbing thoughts that made John such a terrifyingly dangerous person. 
active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Mass casualty incidents. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Mass casualty incidents. Telephone records were obtained and showed that John made a phone call to the church in February. Though the records were from a landline inside John's house, he didn't have a cell phone at the time, but it could safely be presumed that John was the one who made the call, at least, when taken into consideration with the rest of the overwhelming evidence. Richland County Sheriff's deputies went to John's home, really, his mother's house, the day after the shooting. After she was informed of what her son had done, she collapsed to the ground. When she was able to regain her faculties, she allowed police to search John's room without a warrant. A digital camera was found with images of John standing before a Confederate flag. There was a significant amount of ammunition located, and a photo was taken of a white pillowcase that was cut into a triangle. The officer that took the pictures of the pillowcase later testified that she did so because, quote, To me, it represents what could be a Ku Klux Klan hood. The interrogation of John was most atypical compared to how they typically transpire. John confessed in full and provided a mountain of details of how and why he committed such atrocities. He claimed to have purchased the firearm about two months before the shooting. He confessed that the mission was to kill black people. John planned to purchase, quote, the big, the best, the biggest caliber of gun he could find in an effort to seek retribution for the wrongs he believed black people committed against whites. John boldly stated he intended to start a race war and admitted that he killed perfectly innocent people, but tried to rationalize this grotesque statement by saying that black people kill innocent white people every day. The absurdity of this statement is a scary reflection of the darkness in John's heart. He continued by explaining to police that he's researched churches and other places online, but ultimately chose the Mother Emmanuel, A-M-E, church, because it seemed like a good place to find black people. You know, it's an historic A-M-E church. I mean, I guess that's pretty much the reason. Well, how did you find out about that A-M-E church in Charleston? Research it. Yeah, I just looked up black churches on the internet. Yeah, where'd you do that at? Uh, there's a website called SCI Way, like SCIWay.net. You know, it's got a bunch of stuff about South Carolina. Okay, so you were you went on the internet to look to find black churches, and you knew South Charleston had a, a high black population. And, and it right, was I mean, well, I could have done it in Columbia, too. There's black churches in Columbia. It's just, I don't know, I just wanted to go to Charleston, I guess. Yeah. I don't really know. At the Times or something, I guess. Was that an African-American woman or a white yes, woman? Yes, yes. Well, this is an African Methodist Episcopal. Is that what AME stands for? I think I think that's what it stands for. I'm not so sure. that, that's why you wanted to that why you chose that church? Well, yes. Because you were looking for African-Americans. Right, right. John said that he originally planned to seek out a festival, attended by mainly black people, but decided against it because it would likely be heavily secured by police and guards. A church felt safer, due to its very nature of accepting outsiders with open arms and believing in the good in others. Churchgoers would be much less suspicious and much more attainable. The entire thought process is so unsettling, yet proof that deep-seated racism still can exist in the hearts and minds of some. John knew of the Bible study at the Mother Emanuel AME Church because he admitted to making a previous visit where a parishioner was standing outside and told him about it. John was preparing and planning for months before carrying out his attack. Were they having a meeting or something? Or? No, 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 this was a Bible study class. So you knew the Bible study class was going to happen? Yes. Because I had went there before and asked them. Okay, so you've been to the church before? Well, not in it. But outside, so when do you have Bible study? Or? Well, yeah, I just saw somebody get into their car and asked them. When was that? Oh, that was like, oh, God. That was probably... I, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. 
purchased the Glock 45 semi-automatic pistol at Shooter's Choice on April 16th, 2015, and spent the next couple of months buying volumes of ammunition, including 45 caliber hollow point bullets and a laser sight. Well, I did. I kill. Oh, well, I guess. I mean, I don't really know. Well, well, what, 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 I mean, well, I mean, I don't know how many people or anything like that. So, did you, did you shoot them? Yes. What kind of gun did you use? <laughs> A Glock 45. Was that was that your gun or? Yes, I bought it from the gun store. Well, which gun store did you buy that from? Uh, Shooter's Choice. Shooter, shoot, shoot, in West Columbia, Shooter's Choice. Uh, well, it's in Columbia. I'm not sure. Which one? Yeah. The one, they got the indoor gun range there. Yes, yeah. I've never used it, but yes, they have. A mere week before the shooting, John bought 88 bullets at Walmart. They too were the hollow point bullets which expand when they hit the target. John talked about photos he had taken of himself using a timer on a camera. These photos contained images of John burning an American flag, and two of him in a cemetery, one for Confederate soldiers, and one for former slaves. It cannot be stated enough just how sick, disgusting, and horrific John's actions, thoughts, and ideas are and were. What was, perhaps, the most sickening statement John made was when he indicated that he nearly didn't proceed with the shooting because the folks at the Bible study were just so nice to him. You, you had a thought about leaving, right? Yes, I did. But then you said, no, I, I'm here, I gotta do it. Right. He certainly underestimated the pure kindness and compassion he would encounter from his victims. John also told police that when he left the church, he stopped at an ATM to obtain $20 in cash so he could stop for gas along the way. Many admissions of racist thoughts were made, including statements such as, I did it. I killed them. He thought everyone would run for the door. Whoa. Yeah, I mean, I just... I went to that church in Charleston. He was in awe that no cops showed up after he fired 77 bullets. You didn't even leave, so where do you go? Well, to be honest, I was in absolute awe that there was nobody out there after I had shot that many bullets. I was like, right. oh my god, what are these cops doing? They're not even really doing their job. If you hear how many shots, I don't know how many shots that was. What is it? Seven times eleven. Seventy-seven. You know, and there's not even a cop outside. You know, so obviously, when I walked out that door, you know, I peeked out the door because I thought there was going to be somebody there ready to shoot me. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's really why I had the glass magazine. Is not to shoot cops, it's so I could shoot myself. You see what I'm saying? And finally, he expressed shock that nine people were murdered, saying it made him feel bad. John's demeanor was so nonchalant and emotionless that it was eerie that less than 24 hours earlier he had committed such a malicious act of mass murder. John was born on April 3, 1994, at Baptist Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. His parents divorced a few years before his birth and then reconciled, which is when John was born. The couple broke up again for good shortly after. John's dad was a carpenter, and mom was a bartender when he was born. When John was about five years old, his father remarried in November of 1999, and his stepmom went on to become a major influence in his life. His dad and stepmom divorced about ten years after getting married. As a child, John admitted to having odd thoughts and feelings, and as early as eight years old, he recalls noticing 